We have come to be fed by you through him. We are all students in the school of knowledge. Lord, we have been gathered so that your name will be glorified. Bless all who are here. Bless all who are still on their way. Let us be filled with every joy. We ask you, Father, to be the beginning of this gathering. As this occasion continues, let us continue to enjoy the fullness of your presence. And at last, may this lecture end in a very fulfilled way. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you very much, Father Suril Guy, for your soul consoling prayers. Uh, the next agenda here, before we continue, may I quickly introduce to you management staff of the University of Joss that are here to grace this occasion. The management staff of the University of Joss is here is led by the 10th Substantive Vice-Chancellor of the University, Professor Tanko Ishaya, FBCS, FNCS, who is here ably represented by the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Administration, who is also a Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Professor Juhash Ojo Amopitan. With him also, is the Registrar of the University of Joss, Dr. Rejoice Songden. Also here is the Bossa of the University of Joss, Mr. Philip Mbugala, who is here represented by a Senior Deputy Bossa in the Bursary Department, Mr. Adamu Aku. Here also is the chairman inaugural cum lecture committee, Professor Pick Woche. Other deans and directors here present, heads of departments and units, distinguished guests, gentlemen of the press, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 107th inaugural lecture here in the University of Jos. Uh, having done this, the next thing here is to the opening remarks by the chairman, inaugural committee, Professor Pick Uweche. A round of applause for him while he comes. Professor Sir. Let me start by formally welcoming you to the 107th inaugural lecture series to be presented today by Professor Jeff Godwin Doki. Every inaugural lecture must make a statement, and I do believe that today Professor Doki will be making a statement, and I crave your indulgence to please listen and let's hear him profess. Let me also remind colleagues and fellow senators who are here to present their inaugural lectures that they are owing me and they shall come and pay. Professor Doki is paying his debt today. From today, he's no longer a debtor. And all who have not presented are debtors. <laughs> The only absolution is for you to present. But today, I wish you a good listening time, and I do believe that it will be worth the while. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Please, I want to all stay, please. 
still on my feet to please plead with those behind to fill up the vacant seats so that those who will be coming later will join us behind in order to avert distraction. As you do that, God will bless you. Thank you very much, the Chairman, Senate Inaugural Committee. The next item here on the program is the Vice Chancellor's address. But uh, while I invite him, may I quickly also, among us here, recognize the presence of the Assistant Corps Commandant, Mr. Kelvin Akagere, Unit Commander Bukuru, who is also here with us. At this moment, put your hands together as I invite the Vice Chancellor, Professor Tanko Ishaya, FBCS, FNCS, to make his address. The Vice Chancellor, sir. Thank you very much, the master of today's occasion. Let me start by acknowledging the registrar, the bursar, the chair of the Nagura committee, deans and directors that are present here, professors, heads of departments, our very, very distinguished invited guests, and of course, I want to warmly appreciate and acknowledge the inaugural lecturer, Professor Godwin Doki Jeff, as well as the guests he has invited from all over the country. Um, gentlemen and ladies, members of the press, an occasion of inaugural lecture is a very, very important occasion. And it is part of the university mandate. And that is why an inaugural lecture is normally chaired by the vice chancellor. And uh, today, the vice chancellor, Professor Tanko Ishaya, unfortunately, He's on another important assignment outside the country. When he approved this day for this lecture, his thought was that he was going to be around and preside over this very, very important occasion. But nonetheless, because we'll be hosting the Nigerian University Games, NUGA, early next year, he got a special invitation to attend the World University Games in China. So I am sure that the Vice Chancellor has duly expressed his apologies to the inaugural lecture, lecturer. And uh, the University of Just Act also mandated the Vice Chancellor to perform his duties through his Deputy Vice Chancellors. So I'm here wearing two hats, the hat of Deputy Vice Chancellor Administration and also the hat of the Vice Chancellor of the University of Jos. Now, I don't want to call on debtors to raise up their hands, but you have listened carefully to the chair of the Nagora Committee that today is a very special and important occasion for Professor Jeff Ducky. You were once a debtor, but in a short while, your debts are forgiven. For anyone that is a professor in any university or tertiary institution for that matter, an inaugural is that intellectual and academic craftsmanship, which is evidence through a lecture, and I have it here, as evidence that Professor Jeff Doki has duly paid his dues. And therefore, you are especially welcome into this very, very special club. The University of Jos, in accomplishing its mandate, is taking inaugural lectures to be very, very important. And that is why 
Exactly a week ago, we were here to celebrate another very, very important and cerebral, cerebral scholar from the College of Health Sciences, who is also present here today. An inaugural location is an occasion for staff and the students. So I'm by no means leaving out our students, great Josite, that are present here. We appreciate you because you have allowed yourself to be mentored by professors. Professor Jeff Godwin Doki, PhD, professor of literature, comparative literature. You are here this afternoon, therefore, to present your years of intellectual service, not only to the University of Jos, but to the Federal Republic of Nigeria. I dare say that professors, professors, and uh, we are going to be listening to a very important lecture that is tied to poetry and global peace. I don't want to stand between you and the inaugural lecturer. Last week, we also remarked that it is not just an offense for a professor not to deliver his inaugural lecture. It is a sin. And when we say it is, it's an academic sin, so when you talk of a sin, it means that it's greater than committing a crime. So for those of you that are yet to present your inaugural lecture, we are challenging you today to liaise with the chair of the inaugural committee and get enlisted. Our arms are open to receive every one of you. Let me quickly end so that you can listen to the lecturer, and at the end of the day, it is for us to judge and ascertain whether the lecturer has actually done justice to poetry and global peace. Let me apologize. This lecture, there was a mix-up, but I use this opportunity to inform senators that henceforth, our inaugural lectures will hold in the afternoons by 3 p.m. And uh, this is the global practice. And secondly, it allows our colleagues and students to have their lectures in the morning, and then they can come for the inaugural, and thereafter they may close for the day. I invite every one of you to listen very carefully. There's something that you are going to gain from this lecture. I remember several years ago when I offered literature in English in the secondary school, there used to be a, an aspect of literature in English known as unseen poet and poetry. And my literature teacher will tell you that what is unseen in the classroom will be seen on exam day. So what is unseen in the career of Professor Jeff Godwin Doki over the years will be seen this afternoon. Thank you very much, and God bless all of you. Thank you very much, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Tanku Ishaya, who is here ably represented by the Deputy Vice Chancellor Administration, Professor Joash Amopitan, SAN. Thank you very much, gentlemen and ladies. We have come to the next item on the agenda here which is the citing on the inaugural lecture. It is at this juncture that I want to invite Professor Patricia Lar, alongside the inaugural lecturer, Professor Jeff, to come forward here. A round of applause for them as they come forward, please. Uh, Mr. Vice Chancellor, principal officers of the university and members of the university governing councils who are present here, 
members of Senate and all professors of the university who are present, deans, directors, heads of departments. It is a personal honor for me to read the citation of my brother and friend, uh, Professor Jeff Dockey, with whom we share a lot in common. He's a literary scientist, and I'm a microbiologist. And he's younger than I. We share memories of a very great friend, the late Professor uh, Musa Dauda Enna, who, came, who brought us together when Jeff was a very young man and a young lecturer in the university. I'm very proud to present his citation. Royal Fathers here present, <laughs> members of the press, ladies and gentlemen. Professor Jeff Godwin Ducky, a scholar whose research activities have demonstrated abundantly that he's not only a doyen, but also a colossus in the faculties of arts and social sciences. Jeff Ducky's father, Mr. Vincent Ducky, was a brilliant and respected school teacher from Ushongo local government area of Benue State in the early 70s. He was a Roman Catholic mission uh, worker who was posted to Ikpa Iongo <laughs> in Gwer local government area of Benue State. He was a head teacher and that was when he met the mother of Professor Jeff Dockey, Mrs. Esther Ahembe, who herself was daughter of a protestant, a very prominent protestant. And they got married, and in the early 70s, Jeff was born on February the 4th of 1972. He spent his first years of his childhood in that land, and he's the second of eight children. His older sisters and the younger one died very early. Two of his other brothers died some 20 years ago, and his three surviving siblings are now in the village. This is the beginning of the story of a young man, Jeff Doki. His father maintained a library, and that time there were no televisions or internet to distract the young man. And so Jeff Doki uh, got into reading. He became a very prodigious reader after attending a boarding school. First at Lessel and later in Sokoto where he obtained his secondary school education. No wonder Jeff speaks Hausa very well. In 1994, he obtained a BA in English here at the prestigious University of Jos with a Upper, a second class upper division. We give him a round of applause for that. <laughs> After the mandatory NYSC, Jeff enrolled for the MA in English. He majored in African and English poetry, graduating in 1998. And thereafter, he got a PhD in 2007, becoming the first in his family to be to acquire a university degree and also a PhD. <laughs> Jeff Dockey became an assistant lecturer in, 19, in the year 2000, uh, in the year 2000, and he was with the Division of General Studies here at the University of Jos. It was during this time he met his dear, beautiful wife, Mrs. Angela Ngozi Agu and they got married in the year 2004. Their first son came in 2006, Benedict, and later three girls, Joy, Bernice, Favor, Ducky. All of them came in. By the year 2010, Jeff Ducky rose to the rank of senior lecturer and sought to be transferred to his mother department, English. 
Jeff Dorkey realized his writing talents during the secondary education, uh, secondary school education. He won the prize for essay competition in 1984, uh, titled Shoinka and Achebe, Who is the Greatest? As a university teacher, he became a columnist with the Vanguard and Punch newspapers, but for his getting attacks on the government and for his trenchant analysis of social political issues, he adopted two pen names, Big Buffer and Grandmaster at the University of Joss. <laughs> Jeff became very popular on the campus with his column, Flowers for My Land, and that was featured under the newsletter, the popular newsletter which Professor Ozoji of Faculty of Education floated. The name was Professor Ozoji. Thank you for giving Jeff that platform. In 2003, Jeff Doki uh, became a columnist with Bao Bao, an international African people and economy magazine, which is based in Ghana. His most influential essay was titled Chibo Girls, Terrorism's New Face, which was published in New York Times, an American international newspaper in 2016. Since 2001, Professor Jeff Doki has produced more than 30 vinaigrettes for the Academic Staff Union of universities, ASU. He became very popular, and the ASU honored him during one of its Congress meetings in the year 2021. ASU gave Jeff Dockey a standing ovation for those writings. He was, he, he was popular as a teacher of GST 101, the use of English. This course is compulsory. It's a compulsory course for all undergraduate students here at the University of Jos. In English department, uh, at all levels, undergraduate students, MA and PhD students were all Jeff's students. He became a reader in 2013, and he later enrolled for a second master's in peace and conflict management. And in 2015, he graduated. By 2017, he became a full professor. And a professor. During these years, Professor Jeff produced 32 peer-reviewed articles, four books, two monographs, and delivered over 35 presentations at conferences and seminars. He has also supervised about seven PhD candidates and over 32 MA students. In 2016, Professor Jeff Doki, who is a famed scholar, was offered a sabbatical in Nasara State University in Kefi. He collaborated with the heads of department there and expanded his academic syllables and included world literature. He worked with one professor, Olu Obafemi, who became his friend and is a friend of the late professor David Kerr. They gave Jeff the opportunity to be productive and he was energized. He had that opportunity and he took it back to the University of Chelsea. As a scholar, Jeff Doki is also a visiting professor at the Plateau State University in Borkos. He was also a one-time acting head of department there. During that time, the department secured the NUC uh, full accreditation status. And he is the current editor, general editor of the JOS Journal of Written and Oral Literature. 
Jeff has collaborated with Professor David Jowitt and started a non-governmental organization called Shakespeare in Nigeria. So much about the Shakespeare thing, it took him all over the world. The NGO with Professor Jowitt saw to it that people took interest in the study of William Shakespeare, one of the greatest literaries that were given to humanity. And there were barriers to reading Shakespeare because of the old or kind of strange English or language, which was a barrier. But Jeff took the challenge and promoted the subject of Shakespeare and drew interest from students of literature all over the world. Through the NGO, Jeff Doki traveled to many parts of Nigeria and Africa, providing perceptible insights that would enhance a proper understanding of William Shakespeare. As a master of fact, Professor Doki has traveled to all the 36 states of Nigeria and six foreign countries, promoting the Shakespearean experience. Since 2015, Jeff Doki has been working with humanitarian and prevention projects and another NGO which is concerned with providing humanitarian aid during violent conflicts and promoting peace in Nigeria. And for this reason, he has been abroad and many other countries to help young men and women uh, to become local peace ambassadors and conflict managers. Professor Jeff Doki has enjoyed several other privileges, and, such as traveling to the United Kingdom to visit Stratford upon Avon. That is the hometown of William Shakespeare. He must be our own William Shakespeare. <laughs> he also traveled with a Canadian-led team to South Africa for an international program for global peace sponsored by the Nasserah State University in 2016. Professor Jeff Doki is a Catholic by faith and a knight of St. Molumba. He has a lot of hobbies. He loves music. He reads a lot. And his favorite artists are the Senegalese Ekon, uh, Tracy Chapman, Whitney Houston, Asake and Bama Boy here in Nigeria. These are some of his lessons. There are two secrets about Jeff Ducky that you need to know about. His friends criticize, they normally call him GMJ. This is an acronym for Grand Master Jeff. <laughs> Arising from the prize he won prizes he won as a best student in literature during the school days. The other, the other secret that is that DJ Jeff has been a DJ. <laughs> While he was an undergraduate student, uh, he, he was the greatest of the DJs in his times. No wonder, when he walks and bounces, he bounces like he's dancing. <laughs> Sadly, Professor Doki's father died in 2010, and his siblings and mother are still alive. He has many responsibilities administratively and academically. He has been an exam officer in the general uh, studies division here in the University of Jos and in the Department of English. He has been an acting uh, deputy dean, an acting head of department, a representative of faculty of arts in uh, the, uh, to the general studies division of general studies. He is the current head of department of English here at the University of Jos. 
is a member of so many other professional bodies and associations. Among them is the a Society of Library Scholars, Literary Scholars, Association of Nigerian Authors, and Association of World Comparatists uh, uh, from 2015 till dead. His community services are so many. He has been a returning officer of so many INEC run elections since 2007. He has been an INEC collation officer in Yobe. He has been an INEC returning officer for Riom and, and in Plateau State during the 2011 elections. And recently, he was the INEC returning officer for Just Not and Riom local government during the 2023 uh, general elections. He's received so many awards, so many recognitions by students, by various professional bodies. He was the best graduating student in the Department of English, uh, University of Joss. He received the Wallace Inca Foundation Award Best Literature Student. Those were all very distinctive awards. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to present to you this young, energetic, uh, literary general and a great human exemplar. This man standing before you is a remarkable personality that has in him wit, intelligence, and a lot of wisdom. This is a man of flame and flower, a passionate lover of life, and full of laughter. A man who has exceptional ear for music and poetry and the power of art. The Vice Chancellor, sir, standing before you, is a professor of comparative literature, an erudite scholar of peace studies. I present to you this young man, Professor Jeff Godwin Ducky, to present his inaugural lecture. Thank you very much, Professor Patricia La, one for your mellifluous voice and uh, your near, near infallible accent. Um, I am not I am not a cultivated man. So from the very beginning, I plead that you excuse my own too taught speech. I was never taught rhetorics in school. What I'm going to tell you is bare and clear, and it will not be more than 45 minutes. I will do it in 40 minutes. Protocol, the Vice Chancellor, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Admin and Academic, the Registrar, the University Boza, the University Librarian, members of the University Governing Council here present, the Dean of Arts, Chairman and members of Deans, Directors and Provosts, Professors and members of Senate here present, members of the Knight of St. Mulumba KSM, Priests and members of St. Kevin Catholic Church on Guarogu, President and members of the University of Just Alumni Association, President and members of the University of Just Students in our government here present, the Exco and members of Mzotiv University of Just Chapa, Zaki Peter Petitif of Plat of Plateau State, Zaki Apu Jembe Teo Mano on the Plateau, my family members, gentlemen of the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, great Josites. Great Josites. I consider this occasion an additional privilege, an addition, a very huge addition to my privileges because I'm honored to mount the pulpit like 
my other colleagues have done to present my inaugural lecture. It's a thing of joy to me. I would have presented my inaugural lecture since 2017 when I was announced full chair, but the COVID-19 and the incessant ASU strike arising from government's refusal to fund tertiary education or united to stop my ambition. Uh, in the first place, as a professor, I know that an inaugural provides the professor, you know, with the opportunity to profess about matters of academic interest. One, it provides the professor with the opportunity also to talk about matters that are significant importance to the wider community. I'm a professor of comparative literature. So my job as a comparatist is to find correspondences between disciplines. The duty of the comparatist is to find situations and uh, you know, find emotions and find connections between various dif disciplines. It means invariably that comparative literature is an area that can be studied with any discipline at all, whether science, history, religion, or peace. I believe also that the inaugural provides the, the professor with the opportunity, you know, to talk about matters of universal significance. My topic is poetry and global peace. And I want to believe it has universal significance. Because in a world which we inhabit today, a world where conflict and violence has, have become permanent forms of our daily existence, in a world where conflicts have all but changed, and there's a fundamental shift in the evolution of conflicts, I believe my topic, my choice of poetry, is proper. It's a particular method that can help bring about peace in society. And I'm saying that because I strongly believe that poetry can do this in four ways. One, because of the wide range of subject matter that it can cover. Two, because it can incite, incite the emotional interest of man. And three, because it can develop sympathetic openness. And four, poetry can serve as a, a valid transmitter of human experience. So this is how I intend to proceed. First, I will talk briefly about poetry. Why I'm doing that, I'll be drawing a relationship between poetry and other sciences, showing its superiority, especially in the sciences. Then I will talk about the failure of international methods. I will talk about peace, briefly. Then I will talk about oration and uh, the efficacy of tradi other traditional methods of poetry in bringing about peace in society. So here we go. Let's begin with poetry. Many people hate poetry. And when you mention poetry, people are scared, generally, because it's assumed to be something esoteric, you know, something mysterious, because the poet relies on heavy, elusive phraseology, you know, to give meaning to the audience. So people are generally scared of poetry. But let me warn from the very beginning, Mr. Vice Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, that I'm using the term poetry to mean the whole gamut and vast of human experience expressed in imaginative literature. I'm using the term poetry to cover for the lyric, the ballad, the ode, the elegy, philosophical verse. I'm using the term poetry, in other words, to mean all of imaginative literature. And it is no accident that the whole of literature could be referred to as poetry. Um, William Wordsworth has written that the poet is a man with a more comprehensive soul, a man with more enthusiasm and more tenderness. I'm talking about who the poet is. Shelley said, the poet is like a nightingale who sits in darkness and sings a song to cheer the whole of mankind. And the listeners of this song are people who are enthralled because they are listening and they are enjoying it because they are carried along. It is important we know that as we move along. So, we're not talking about poetry here to me, lines like sonnets and all that. But more specifically, poets are the hero fans of an unapprehended inspiration. That's uh, Shelley again. And his greatness stems from the fact that by constantly providing pleasure to us, the po poetry has assumed the unassailable position, position of being the greatest knowledge on earth. 
And I mean all other forms of knowledge, science, law, history, philosophy, religion, they spring from poetry. I know my colleagues, my colleagues, my colleagues, my, my colleagues in other sciences will be wondering why I'm giving so much respect to poetry, because that's my earlier. And when I was talking about this, I'm, I was reminded of uh, my friend, Dr. Jimam La, head of history, because he's a historian. I'm sure he's here. <laughs> we shall discuss that later. So I am saying that all forms of knowledge, including medicine, Dr. Piuna is here too, they emanate from poetry. And I'm speaking, of, I'm speaking upon authority. <laughs> Okay, so here we are. Let me show you the greatness of poetry by providing this illustration. Generally, today in human society, there is this tendency to abase the knowledge offered by the poet. And those who pursue this line of thought think that poetry is a better form of knowledge because it cannot compare technology. Because technology is more, much more than poetry because of the need to provide our human needs of today, technology, communication, the telephone, the computer. But let me give you the greatest shock. On August 6, 1945, the knowledge of science became very destructive. The brief on that will be insightful. That was the day an American B-29 dropped one single bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. 150,000 people died. About 75% of that city's buildings were collapsed. And shortly after that incident, the President of the United States at that time, Harry Truman, came out on air to announce publicly, without any remorse, that the basic power of the universe has been unleashed against Japan. Since that incident, we know that problems have started. The atomic age has started. Since that incident, you find that other researches in chemical weapons and uh, weapons of mass destruction have continued, unabated. Since that incident, there have been attempts to adjust man's thinking and institutions to the dimensions of this crisis, but all those attempts have failed. Of course, we know for sure that since that incident also, a Cold War followed from 1945 to 1990 between two superpowers, the United States, a democracy, and the USSR, a totalitarian state. The two, these two superpowers struggled to destroy the world with weapons of awesome destructiveness. Needless to say that since that incident, there have been threats of nuclear weapons and mass destruction up to February 2022, which is happening between Ukraine and Russia. One can go on and on and on citing those examples. So what am I talking about? The point I'm making is that the knowledge of the man of science can never be greater than the knowledge of the poet. Yes, because it has no way of advancing mankind. It has no way of showing mankind what is the best thing or the way to know ourselves and the world. I've cited T.T. Lawson there. He said, for all the advance of science in modern times, it tells us virtually nothing about the human psyche upon which that advance has entirely depended. But let me provide another, another illustration to show clearly the distinction between science and poetry. The knowledge of the poet is a necessary part of our existence. We must live with it. We need it. It's our unalienable inheritance. It comes to us naturally and we enjoy it. But the knowledge of this the, science, the man of science is a knowledge that is enjoyed in solitude. He's, the man of science seeks truth as an unknown benefactor. He cherishes and loves it alone. But the poet, when he profess knowledge, is singing a song in which all of humankind join with the poet to rejoice in the presence of truth. That's the supremacy of poetry over other forms of knowledge. So it will easily be perceived that Unlike medicine or biology or one of those other sciences that are concerned with dissection, you know, or broken and items down into constituent parts, poetry does not behave that way. Poetry deals primarily with emotions and intuition and feelings. And it is through these intuitions, these true emotions, that the poet has the capacity, you know, to unite the whole of mankind. It is true emotions that the poet, you know, can bring the whole vast knowledge of human empire together. As a matter of fact, and I've said it, that we can say with considerable justification that the entire world will become barren 
and the tree of life will have no fruits if poetry is blighted. I, I will leave companion to that because it's an old idea, but it's there. It has been discussed by Plato in his book, The Iron, that the poet is a light and wing and holy thing. It has been discussed by John Dryden in his poem entitled the Absalom and Ahitophel. You can get the equivalent of that poem from the second Samuel chapter 15. And Shakespeare has done that too in his uh, Midsummer Night's Dream when he said, the lunatic, the lover, and the poet are all of imagination compact. What is poetry? I want to spare you that trouble. It's in the booklet. So that we'll move forward. I promise you 40 minutes. And I'm going to keep that time. So you can read what is poetry from your booklet. It's there. Peace. Global peace. If you're observant enough, you'll notice that human beings generally tend to be excited with war and violence more than peace. Yes. When we are traveling in a bus and we see a scene involving accidents and corpses, we must stop. We're curious to know who and who is there. We enjoy watching it. When we watch television, we're more interested in watching war movies than peace movies. That's human nature. Even when we read the newspapers, audiences are more excited when they see banners like Ukraine and Russia go to war today. Or Ukraine and Russia did not go to war today, they will not be happy. That is the way we are. Even world leaders like Thomas Jefferson of the United States once said, peace is our passion, but he went ahead to add that but the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time by the blood of tyrants and patriots. Follow him closely is Benjamin Franklin, one of the founding fathers of the United States of America. He also said, even peace can be purchased at too high a price. And of course, the Chinese revolutionary leader, Mao Zedong, once said, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. The Italian, the fascist Italian dictator Benito Mussolini once intoned, war alone brings up to their highest tension all human energies and put a stamp of nobility on those who are prepared to meet with it. These are world leaders speaking, and they're drawing attention that we prefer war, we like violence. So it is no surprise, therefore, that in the present century in which we inhabit, the 21st century, you know, it is, the century is frightening and unpredictable and dangerous. Look everywhere. We discover that the threat of nuclear war, which dominated centuries ago, must have subsided, but conflict and war are still with us every day. I've provided data. From 1992 to the present, the United Nations has been involved in more than 32 peacekeeping operations. By any conceivable standards, therefore, it means that the presence and intensity of conflict has been remarkably high. You know, the number of people affected by conflict has been considerable. You know, ethnic, communal, religious, sessionist conflict have shaped the international community of the 21st century and they have also dictated for us, you know, the need to devise effective strategies for cooperation and conflict resolution. Global peace. It's a difficult term to define. It's in the booklet. If we are compared, to, if we must define peace, we can simply say it is a absence of war, fear, anxiety, suffering, and violence. But global peace particularly simply means um, peaceful coexistence of all existence. I have cited Johan Gatung, the Norwegian peace scholar, famed one. He identified two kinds of peace, negative peace and positive peace. By negative peace, he means the absence of direct violence like war, fear, and peace. I, I'm, on, on the other hand, and then by positive peace, he means the absence of unjust structures and the presence of justice, freedom, and development. But global peace is important because there are many indirect casualties of war or conf of conflict. So the point we're making is that war itself typically retards development. Conflict destroys existing infrastructure. It devastates natural environments. It displaces huge numbers of people who become hem homeless and desperate refugees. And it also creates long-lasting wounds, especially psychological wounds. theoretical basis. In academics, it's expected that uh, when we talk, we're concerned with theory. I've adopted two particular theories for this uh, lecture. They are the function of poetry, that is coming from the Faculty of Arts in my area. It was developed by Matthew Arnold, 
and he simply demonstrated basically in two of his essays the study of poetry and the function of criticism at the present time. What Arnold is saying in these two essays is that poetry has a particular way of teaching man. It does not teach man the way the scientists teach man. It does so because it appeals to the soul of man. Then the second theory is human security. Of course, you know it's an interdisciplinary research, so this is from the social sciences now. It's difficult to define this one too. It has caused a lot of controversy and debate. But simply, it means safety from chronic threats like hunger, disease, and repletion. The UNDP has concretely decided to expand this particular theory to include five human components. Economic security, food security, health security, environmental security, personal security, community security, and political security. So the obvious implication is that the whole concept of peace has changed dramatically in the present century. That's the point we're making. Security is interpreted to mean the security of people, not just territory. Security of individuals, not just nations. You know. That's, that, 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 that. We must get that right. Those are the two theories on which this, uh, whatever is hinge. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, ladies and gentlemen, I have in this lecture identified two key weaknesses that made me to embark on research on poetry to see how it can bring about peace in society. And these weaknesses are the failure of homegrown methods and the failure of international methods are bringing an end to conflict. If you look around us, you discover that anytime there's violence or war or crisis, the first two strategies to be adopted in international peace and conflict resolution is negotiation and bargaining. They are always the first. Sometimes they don't work, but they are always the first to be tried. And Article 31, subsection 1 of the UN Charter even encourages negotiation, although it has its own many weaknesses. And some of them are the inability to determine which kind of conflicts are amenable to negotiation, how concessions should be offered, when negotiations should be employed as an appropriate response to a conflict. And so it means that we must consider that Although negotiation is the most frequently preferred conflict resolution in international relations, it has failed to provide a political agreement or settlement because of the following reasons. Structural barriers. And by structural barriers, I mean the refusal of parties in a conflict to accept the validity you know, and legitimacy of the other parties. The cl most clearest and recent example is Russia, Ukraine, 2022. It was the same thing in Rwanda, 1994. You know. Other weaknesses of uh, negotiation and bargaining may include strategic barriers, by which I mean mutual distrust among the parties. Others may include, you know, institutional and cultural barriers. Peacekeeping. This is the most recent addition to international methods of peace and conflict resolution. Unlike negotiation and bargaining, which have been used by states for hundreds of years, peacekeeping only started in 1956, you know, and it is a prophylactic course of action. I mean, preventive. Prophylactic means preventive. It's not meant to be curative, you know. In other words, it is not a method of resolving the conflict. It is just basically concerned with prevention of the eruption of armed conflict. So relations between these two groups became tense, quite often culminating into war. In 1993, you know, they were able to achieve some peace a deal, a peace deal. But, and a, a power and a power sharing deal too, but it was not implemented. Now, Hutu extremists decided to form private militias to eliminate all Tutsis. So, in 1994, the sad thing is that the Organization of African Unity, as was called at that time, could not stop these warring parties most lamentably was that the international organization, the United Nations Security Council, ordered a complete withdrawal of all its troops from Rwanda. So the Hutus had a free day. In fact, the peace, peacekeeping unit commander, Romy Edale, had warned them. He had presented evidence to the UN that there's a clear case of genocide lingering here, but they turned deaf ear to his council. So by April 1994, the Hutus had their way and they killed about 800,000 people, most of them Hutus. Tutsis, and if any other person who supported peace with the Tutsis. In July 1995, one year after the Rwandan genocide, it was the turn of uh, uh, Bosnian Serbs who overran the city of Spreneka and killed 8,000 people. And this tragedy took place 
in, in the, under the eyes of the UN Dutch peacekeepers. In 2003, it was the turn of Darfur. Rebels in Darfur rose against the government of President Omar Bashi, saying that he discriminated against Arab farmers. Although the United Nations sent 26,000 troops four years later, but they were unable to arrest the situation. In Syria and other surrounding countries, there are several conflicts involving different terrorist groups, and the UN is helpless because Russia, a permanent member and ally of Syria, has utilized its veto powers at the times to protect Syria. Then there's Southern Sudan, fighting between two rival groups, the Dinkas and the Noahs. The civil war there has displaced about 382,000 people have been killed, 2.5 people are forced to flee, and about 5 million people are facing severe insecurity. Meanwhile, the UN has deployed more than 14,500 peacekeeping officers that have failed to address the underlying issues. Then in Yemen, we'll move on to August 2017 in Myanmar, when they launched a major crackdown on the Rohingya Muslim minority, killing almost 24,000 civilians and forcing 750,000 others, including women and children, to flee to Bangladesh. Another, and another permanent member of the United Nations, China, is supporting Myanmar on the Rohingya crisis. But see the most recent example, Russia, Ukraine. Before the invasion of Ukraine on January, February 24, 2022, it was very clear that Russia was ready for invasion. The United Nations, the immediate causes of the war showed clearly that Russia was ready. They refused to accept Ukraine as a legitimate state, NATO's expansion, and the refusal of the West to build a strong market economy in Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union all pointed to the invasion. What was the role of the UN Secretary General? He only ineffectually appealed to Putin. He hurriedly called a meeting at 9.30 p.m. And while the meeting was going on, that was the time um, the Russian president declared a special military operation, and that was the beginning of the, invitation, uh, the, the operation, the invasion. What could uh, the UN Secretary General do? He only appealed ineffectually to Russian president, in the name of the humanity, do not start what may be the most devastating war. In the name of him, everybody knows that the Russian-Ukraine war has continued to destroy key infrastructure. It has displaced population. It has caused a spike in global prices. It is again this background that we look at um, literally text. But I've identified reasons why the UN has failed. They are there in the booklet.
depiction of the human condition with its tragic perspectives, humor, wit, irony, and all that and all that. And that explains why he's the greatest writer in the English language. I've chosen his text measure for measure. The title of this text is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 1 to 2. Do not judge, for the measure you give is the measure you shall receive. And that's what Shakespeare is saying in this plea. In other words, if you live in a glass house, do not throw stones. I don't want to bore you with the long plot of that story. But it tells the story of a woman, Isabella, who wants to become a nurse. She's a beautiful woman, attractive woman. She wanted to become a nurse. And King Angelus, he has a problem. His brother Claudio is in jail for the crime of fornication. And the King Angelus said, I can release your brother only on one condition, to sleep with you. And Isabella said no. But at the end of the play, Isabella forgives the same person who wanted to violate her. So we're talking about issues of mercy here. Mercy is an important component of peace resolution. We find a similar theme in Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. Here is another woman too, Portia. You know, she has the capacity, you know, to change into a man. And at court, she showed herself as a brilliant lawyer before men, showing extraordinary intelligence. He asked Shylock to show mercy because mercy is a component of God and it is beneficial, mutually beneficial, you know, to both the giver and the taker. Then there's another one, Tempest. I won't bore you with the long plots there, in the, there in, the, in the booklet. There's Tempest. It's talking about forgiveness. These are all concepts of peace. Mercy, forgiveness, and love. Here is Duke Prospero. His enemies have sent him out to sea with her daughter, Miranda. But at the end of the play, he forgives his enemies. You can forgive your enemy. Antonio, Alonso, Gozanlo are all forgiven. Forgiveness in Islam is called Afu. It means the pardoner of the most and the most forgiving. And it is part of the 99 names of Allah described in the Quran and the Sunnah. Then I mentioned Samuel Taylor Courage. It's a critic who attempted to combine the concreteness of the Romantic movement with the traditional ideas of uh, rationalism and ideal, classical ideas, you know. His poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, is talking about the Christian pattern of sin, crime, repentance, and forgiveness. So these are basically attributes of peace. And that's the point where we're making. So we find in literary texts all these attributes, mercy, love, forgiveness, reconciliation. There's Romeo and Juliet, a story, a story of tra a tragic story of two lovers. The uh, parents are mortal enemies. But the two children chose to love themselves and get married secretly. The parents are not happy. Then Flair Rollins, the priest there, is able to ensure that Romeo and Juliet get married. They're from the couples and the Montags who are mortal enemies. I ask the question, can Nigerians learn any lesson from the play Romeo and Juliet? No. Only two weeks ago, Fatima was posted to serve in Port Harcourt. Fatima met Anthony there. They wanted to marry. The father of Fatima from Kano said, over my dead body. The father of Anthony in Rivers, they said, no, 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 my daughter cannot marry, my child, my, my son cannot marry a Christian. So these are the issues we're, we're learning here. And uh, apart from the issue of love, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet is talking about marriage. Can marriage add anything to the peacemaking process? Yes. Sometimes activities like marriage can bring about other integrative events. When you marry in the past, the Borno Emir will marry from Kano Emir. And once they exchange daughters, women could be exchanged as a way of bringing about peace. Cheikh Amadu, a certain example of Cheikh Amadu, he provided a good example. He married the daughters of his cousins. And for that reason, his cousins decided to avoid war. Even with all their intention to expand their territory, they knew that their daughters are married in this house. So they migrated and left him. So marriages would be another form of bringing integrative events. And that's another method of peace. So I ask the question, Christianity and Islam, it is left to be said that the values of mercy and forgiveness are to be found in two of the world's biggest religions, Islam and Christianity. In Islam, Rama means compassion. In Islam, Rahim means peace. In Islam, Afu means forgiveness. So you can see that compassion and mercy are co-Islamic values. They underpin the Islamic religion, tradition of peace. So central are these two concepts that every Muslim invokes them before performing any action. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim, meaning in the name of Allah, who is compassionate and merciful. Do I make myself clear? Yeah. That is it. So these are the concepts of mercy 
and they are there in the two religions. So we're now confronted with the big question. If we have all these things going on in Islam and, and Christianity, why do Muslims and Christians fight every day? I provided the answer. The answer is very simple. They read the holy books upside down. They don't know how to read the Quran. They don't know how to read the Bible. Yeah, the imams and the priests and the pastors misinterpret the, the, the Bible and the Quran for us because the, some of them are fanatical about it. And that's the point we're making. Then, global peace, poetry and global peace in African texts. I use only one text. It's written by Yowei Sihai, who was a former teacher here in Nature and um, Faculty of Arts. He's a professor of theater. I think he's now, um, he was one time ambassador, uh, Nigeria's ambassador to Canada. His text is entitled to the Murki Mata, yeah, and in the play Anami Kuru, you know, this Baba takes place, and the government is changed, the new government that comes into power, it's a military regime, and the government, Nigim Nigim, the head of state, is arrested and in jail, and then he's standing trial at the high court, and at the trial it becomes clear that the whole of Africa, it's a gener it becomes a generational trial, the whole of Africa is rotten, but to come to the, two tribes represent the conflict in this play. And I must mention them. The two tribes are called Lobi and Oke. They represent this conflict. They are fighting over water, over farm and grazing lands. The two characters that, that represent this conflict are Tochembe and Adojan Juma. You can see it's a thief name and it's, it's a Fulani name. They hold invectives at each other. But as you come to the end of the play, Commander Kwamandi has the capacity, you know, to reunite all these warring parties. Obviously, this conflict is reminiscent of the thieves and Fulanis of Nigeria. Two ethnic groups who share a joking relationship. We shall come to that as we get to Orecho. I, I want to say that Orecho is a term that is here to find its way in the English dictionary because it was coined by Pio Zirmo, a Ugandan linguist who was killed in Lagos during the first act 1977. After his death, two other scholars, Ungiwa Tiongu and uh, um, Toli of South Africa, Pitik and Toli, have developed this particular concept to mean all songs, all dance and poems and plays that are now written down. So we're saying that in African society, there are some kind of traditional practices that are employed to deal with conflict. And I've highlighted them. The first one is the Peace Festival. It took place, the clearest example was in Waji district of Northeastern Kenya, where Somali clans were fighting over sovereignty issues. So, a particular, a particular peace and development committee, community-based group of, made up of local volunteers, came together and decided to organize a prize for the chief who will make the biggest contribution to peace. Every year, chiefs in Somali, in Waji, began to fight in order to win the prize, and that way, peace was achieved. Then, I talked about art, and I'm using the term here to encompass all written, performing aspects of literature and oratory. It means chants, poetry, songs. And I started an example. Art has the capacity, you know, the artistic space can foster transformation, you know, and pave the way for peace. I provided three examples, but I'm not going to bore you with them. I'll highlight this one. West Africa, in West Africa in the 1980s, there was a conflict between Mali and Burkina Faso. All attempts to bring them together failed. And the president of neighboring Guinea did something wonderful. He called the two presidents together to his palace. And in front of the palace, he called one of Africa's biggest singers, Kanja Koyate, to perform for the presidents. The man sang. The man sang. He sang a song. The song was so emotional that the two presidents, two presidents, two presidents, the two presidents shed tears, hugged themselves, and vowed not to return to war. I'm showing you the power of art. So let's take a look at this. Let's hear it. This is Tracy Chapman. He's talking to us from this song. I will explain. Oh God. 
때문에 Mr. Chapman, she has a degree in anthropology and African studies. She's saying that we human beings, we create the pain and the suffering and beauty in this world. She's saying that at the same time, she's saying that there's heaven here on earth, but we can only achieve heaven through the following conditions. One, we must have absolute faith in humankind. Two, we must have respect for what is earthly. And three, we must an unfaltering or unshakable belief in peace and love and understanding. The song was released in 1995 and the album is entitled New Beginning. Then now in Northern Ireland, I've cited how creative space can bring about peace. Then we move to Central Africa, the Sangwe Festival uh, has the capacity for an event that brings dancers and songs and comedians together. But let me talk about the Just Own. Yeah, just in Nigeria here. There's a place at Dogon Duse called um, White House. There, Muslim boys and girls come, they f come together and form birthday parties. They dance and sing. Yeah. And they're happy. Even when there's tension in just if you go to that place, you find Muslim girls and boys dancing, dancing and smoking together. But they're happy. And they're making a very fundamental statement. They are saying that those who attend the parties have to affirm whatever differences exist, they are together. They are Muslims and they are all Nigerians. Then I moved to the reason of football. It has a very wide appeal. Football, which is accompanied by music, singing, and dancing now. Take the English Premier League, for example. It has united Christians and Muslims along different teams, namely Arsenal, Manchester United, Chelsea, Liverpool. And when the Nigerian national team, the Super Eagles, we don't like the Super Eagles, but we like the Super Falcons now. <laughs> the Super Falcons is playing. All Nigerians are united. They, they, they are united. They come together to cheer their national team to victory. So the point we're making is that the verbal, the pictorial, and communicative as I tool for effective resolution of conflicts, and they should be given more attention than international approaches. Then joking relationships. This is one thing that exists in African societies between ethnic groups. You find two tribes joking and teasing and sharing banters together, you know, and all that. They have the capacity to, it, it contains humor, so it, it has created a limited space in which conflict dynamics are suspended and reconciliation becomes a real possibility. I cited an example from my tribe. The team, some Fulani of Nigeria, share a joking relationship. Um, I, I, as a teacher, I met an army general in the class one day. He was a general, but he was a student of mine in the use of English. After the class, he walked up to me and said, Kai, Munchi, do you know I'm your master? I told him, Agwe, you are lying. You left your cows in the bush and you came to the class and your master and your better here. We joked over it, we laughed over it, and from that day till now, the man is my friend, my close friend, my closest friend. The Afuseris, the Mupun, and the Ngas of Plateau State also share a joking relationship. Apparently, it means that joking relationships all use creative strategies or the moral imagination to transform intractable and even protracted conflicts in society. The folklore. It has to do with our values, traditions, customs, and morals. It has been used effectively in China. It has been used effectively in Finland, in USSR. Ethnographers and folklorists use it. But I give an example in Nigeria, especially in Africa. It's used for many reasons to forge tribal unity, to promote nationalism, anti-colonialism, pan-Africanism, and to show support for ruling parties. The most recent example was in Plateau State in 2007, when Paul in Thailand contested elections in the Labour Party with Jonah Jang of the PDP. And the ballad was composed in the honor of Paul in Thailand. The, ban the ballad went like this. Mama, Paul in Thailand is in Labour. What will she deliver? Baby or menstrual? Because she was in the Labour Party. 
baby or monster. During the Civil War II, we had used folklore for purposes of patriotism and nationalism. I cited example, go on with one Nigeria, which became an acronym for Gawan. But to all this, we must add the proverb, which reflects the highest philosophy of our ancestors. There are many proverbs in the, in the, in the, in the booklet, but I cited three. Just three to show you the example. If you live in the same room with a he goat, you should be prepared to bear with his bad order. It means Christians and Muslims should tolerate each other. The second one, it is two hands that kill a fly, meaning we should be united. Then the last one, one day the snake found itself in the same hole with the hedgehog. The snake bit the hedgehog several times, but without any effect, because the hedgehog had coiled safely into his prickly shell. Frustrated, the snake raised an alarm, to which the hedgehog replied, anyone who is not comfortable in this hole should take his leave, meaning we should tolerate others if we want durable peace in society. Conclusion. I've used several texts and Jones to show the efficacy of poetry as an instrument of bringing peace in society. I want to conclude by saying that the cost of human wars and squandered resources has been extensive, especially in this century. About 200 million people were killed in an estimate of about 250 wars and genocidal onslaughts. The failure of the UN governments and the global community to effectively respond to war and genocide and the failure of the Cold War to provide peace dividends since 1990s makes it apparent that the existing mechanisms for preventing war or conflict are inadequate or non-existent. This is a result of all these weaknesses that I propose will return to poetry to interpret life for us and to bring about durable and global peace. My modest submission is that poetry or imaginative literature in general is uniquely capable of fostering the enlightened activity of the mind for two reasons. One, because of the range and diversity of its subject matter. Two, because it communicates in an informative and effective way through offering us what is a living experience rather than through abstract analysis and description. So I say taken together, it will be perceived that it is by simultaneously tapping the emotional, intellectual, and imaginative resources of man, you know, and bringing them to bear on the subject matter, you know, in a formative way that poetry brings peace in society because poetry has the capacity, you know, to make, let us see through the magic of style and language, we are invited to participate in the experience, you know. We begin, we become part of it. It is during such an experience when the, our intellects, our wills and emotions respond to the poem. It is during such an experience when the human character is integrated, sustaining and completing each other that we find the poem interpreting love for us. Mr. Vice Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, it is therefore my conviction that poetry has the unique capacity to bring about global peace in society. Recommendations, I'm not done. Recommendations and acknowledgements. I want the VC to hear one of them, otherwise they're in the booklet. I would want the VC to hear one of them, especially number three. We should encourage our students and children to develop a reading culture. Our growth as a nation is retarded and stagnated because we don't have a reading culture. What you have in Nigeria is a television and football watching culture. It is only when we read that we shall discover the beauty of poetry as a perennial source of joy and a viable instrument for the resolution of conflicts in society. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, may I humbly and most respectfully recommend that the university management should initiate academic prizes for excellence at the departmental and faculty levels. This will encourage students to read. It seems clear to me that in Nigeria, we develop the leg and not the head. A footballer who wins a trophy is rewarded by Tinubu or Buhari with a mansion in Abuja. But a first-class graduate does not enjoy even the smallest benefit of a handshake with a minister at a convocation ceremony. <laughs> Acknowledgements. First, is to my teacher of English and African Literature, late Professor Ayu Mamudu, 
early enough, he gave me the leg up to appreciate these two areas of study. Secondly, Mr. Vice Chancellor, permit me, my PhD supervisor is here, Professor Bobema, kindly rise for recognition. Thank you very much, Ma. She was my PhD. She was my teacher and my PhD supervisor. She was alive to the many responsibilities of my academic group, and her opinion and advice has been invaluable. I would like to thank the university management, the vice chancellor, all principal officers, chairman of the inaugural lecture committee, members of senate, and members of the university council here present. Let me quickly add that two principal officers of the university, the DVC academic professor Rahila Gawan, she's absent and the registrar, Dr. Rejoice Songden, are my literary sisters. Because, because we belong to the same family of English studies. We belong to the same family of English studies. Miserable thanks to Professor John Akosu, my teacher, my friend and father, he's here too. I think he's part of the senators here. Yeah, Professor John Akosu. <laughs> Professor Jewitt is in London. Enormous thanks are due to my brothers and sisters of the Knights of St. Molumba, especially St. Moses of Kansu, for their show of love and spiritual encouragement. Same with parishioners of St. Kevin's Parish, Sangwarugu, led by my spiritual father, Father Guy. Thank you very much, Father. Many thanks. Many thanks to Professor Lar, the Dean Faculty of Arts, for the brainstorm that continue to spark the imagination. Thanks are due to all my colleagues in the Department of English for their timely suggestions friendship and loyalty. I thank my friends and senior colleagues, Professor Joe Toyorapu, Vice Chancellor of Benue State University, Professor Bernard Matu, Vice Chancellor of Pratu State University, Bokos, Professor Aoudou Naven Gambo, Vice Chancellor of Kalkum University, Jos, Professor Sam Egu, Resident Electoral Commissioner at Benue, Benue State, Professor Samuel Karen Shaka, I think Shaka is here too. Yeah, Professor Musa Izam is here too, robed up. Professor Joseph Miner, the Dean of Education, is here too. He robed up. Professor Monde Nestor, Mang uh, uh, Nestor Chago, Dean of Natural Sciences. Professor Anthony Daku, Dean PG School. Professor Dami Philibus. Professor Chris Vande. Chris Vande is here too. Thank you for recognition. Professor Azaya Lemokan and Professor Sarah Lohas. Many thanks to my two friends, Movun Vincent and Adam Waku. That is the buzzer. Happy birthday, buzzer. Today is his birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday, buzzer. I would like to thank my friends in the Faculty of Arts, beginning with my former dean, Professor Sati Fochak, the head of history, Dr. Jimam Lar, the head of linguistics, Dr. Dan Juma Lengji, the head of theater and film arts, Dr. Nancy King. I owe my students a huge debt of gratitude. I want to thank all my students who have come from far and near, especially Kefi, Bokos, Gombe, and Lagos. My postgraduate students deserve many thanks for the lively conversations and debates we have had concerning poetry. Similarly, I thank all my undergraduate students in the Department of English, great Nazi sites, who have, who have always threatened my belief in the proverb that meat that has fire proves, meat that has fat proves it on the fire. Um, in a very special way, I want to recognize Kevin Akagege, sub commander of uh, Federal Road Safety. Prof, if you have observant, you will notice that. There are road safety officers controlling traffic outside. He's my classmate. He's also a singer. He has been begging that he should be allowed two minutes to sing a song. I wonder whether the, the head of uh, the Nogra series will allow him to do that. He has provided security, I mean, traffic for us. And uh, he's a singer too. I don't know if you can give him two minutes. I owe, um, I think that's all for now, no? There are so many, so long, the list is so long as to embarrass me. I have the pleasure of owing my good friends and cosmetics so immense a debt because I could not bear to owe it to anyone else in the world. They, there, their names are there. Tule Solomon, Andufai, Mason, Godwin, Yala, Akagege, Kevin, Emeka, Kuruka, Tefai, Mbadonka. The list is so long. My good friends and students of Peace Studies, Mr. Bemchile Gado and his wife, and the most thanks are due to the Mzotiv University of Jos, led by Professor Zanzan Uji, Mrs. Felicia Maker, and Engineer Tena Yonem. They're all here. The University of Just Class of 1994, led by my sister and colleague, Dr. Mrs. Queen Parevzoa, she's here, has a special place in this lecture. Same with set 2005 MSc class of Conflict Management and Peace Studies, University of Just, led by Bala Thomas. I want to thank Mrs. Hannah, 
Hamed Zapi, my nurse, she's here. It's a woman who heard me when I was an infant. And there's something about her, something unique about her. Apart from holding me when, she was an, when I was an infant, she was also my father's student in the primary school. Then later, she was my student in the university. She's my mother. She said, please stand for the congregation. <laughs> yes. She heard me when I was two years old. You know, and she's here. Dr. Mrs. Tekumbu, Victoria Pillar, director, is not here. They, 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 they went back. So I will skip that aspect. But I must thank them. Sincere thanks to... Sincere thanks to... Who? Okay. I want to thank Hamezad. Sincere thanks to my colleagues of us, especially the University of Just Chapel. I want to thank my close friend gathered here this morning. I want to believe they are led by Dr. Molus Jube. As a matter of fact, Dr. Jube gave me the Ingas equivalent of the proverb that, say, that shows the conflict between the snake and the hedgehog in the hole. I think Dr. Jube is here. Thank you very much. Plenty thanks are due to Professor Jerome Doga, Dr. Henry Abaya, Ayotunde Mahmoudou Jr., Abel Elojo Chika for, proving, for providing ICT and virtual assistance. Many thanks to my colleague, friend, sister, and mother, Professor Patricia La, for reading my citation with a mellifluous voice and a near-perfect accent. I thank Professor Maka Ngozi Cheke, my friend and colleague, who presented her inaugural just last week. She's also here. All royal fathers gathered here. I cannot thank you enough. I don't want to thank my friends only. I, I don't think that's important. I move finally to thank my friend from ASU, uh, the National Vice President, Professor Piwuna. Finally, I'm thankful to my dear mother, Mrs. Esther Hembe Doki, to whom I'm bound by the strongest affection of my life and whose love and care for me has continued unbroken. I thank my younger brother who is here, Victor Machin Doki, and my wife, Mrs. Angela Ngozi Veren Doki, and my four children, namely, Aondungu, Sewesi, Seyembe, and Selomo, for tolerating my nocturnal habits of scholarship and periodic absences. Thank you very much for listening. Wow, wow. A round of applause for Professor Jeff. A round of applause for Professor. Thank you so much, Professor Jeff, for this wonderful presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please a round of applause for Professor Doke again. He made a request publicly to me asking for a little time for someone to bring a song. I want to publicly acknowledge that and I will ask that you, I just crave your indulgence for some two minutes. Let's hear that golden voice. Please come.
very much a round of applause once more thank you very much thank you thank you thank you professor you will remain standing please at this moment it is a moment of presentation of gifts may I at this juncture once more invite the vice chancellor professor Tanko Ishaya who is here ably represented by the deputy vice chancellor administration Professor Johash Amopitan. Please, the students of the Department of English Language, University of Jos, should get prepared with theirs. They will, off, they will give, they will make their presentation immediately after the Vice Chancellor. The, 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 the immediate family should please come up on stage to join Professor Jeff. The immediate family. Is he around? Okay, thank you very much. Congratulations to our dear Professor Jeff Godwin Doki, congratulations. Congratulations to um, DJ. Say you are a DJ. Congratulations to the Grandmaster Jeff. But we know you to be Professor of Comparative right. Literature in this university. You didn't hint me before coming that. Uh, you are going to party here. I will have uh, also prepared the inaugural chair, who I know is a very wonderful singer too. But before I present the gifts and look at the family very well, I also want to say I have a song to sing. But this song is from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He talked about using poetry as a weapon of peace. And he was very passionate about it. In the process, he condemned every other profession, including the law, legal profession, in terms of knowledge. But he what? He exonerated poetry and literature. Um, he has made his point, and uh, the other joinder of issues or rejoinder is for another day. But I know that poetry has also been used as a weapon of peace. It has also been used as a weapon of what? War. So it depends on how it is deployed. And he talked about so many things, football, folklore, as weapons through which poetry is demonstrated, music. And I recall there was a time Nigeria was playing Senegal in Lagos, and the goals just refused to come. And we needed to have at least a win to be able to make it to the next round. Then, the football supporters club started singing and that is my song and that song is I have a God who never fails I have a God who never fails I have a God who never fails Jesus never fails my Lord never fails forever more Pop! Nigeria score a goal And 
And then the song continued. So those that were Muslim there were also singing. Ah, and they were dancing. Ah, I go. They were clapping and dancing. So one of them said, Elijah Abu Bakr, they are talking of Jesus. You are clapping. He said, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I think that is the type of thing you are trying to demonstrate. Say, it doesn't matter. And as they were singing, they were singing, and that another girl came. Bam! That is how those things can be used as a weapon of peace. Um, I want to congratulate you once again. You have paid your debts, and you all agree with me that he has done justice to this lecture. Do we agree? Or should he come back? Should he come back? Okay, I want to appreciate your family. Your wife is here, and then your wonderful children for giving you the support over the years to have been able to accomplish all this. This is just a precis, just a summary of his intellectual odyssey. And uh, we thank you. And this is just his beginning. He's still very young. Like the uh, person, the professor that read the citation said, you are a very young professor. Um, the vice chancellor now performing his role we don't have, as we said last week, we don't have money, we don't have dollars, we don't have Naira to give. So don't think that this is Naira or dollars that is wrapped. And they begin to worry him, give me money. We don't have. But we have a token as a university in appreciation of your years of service to this university and also to the Federal Republic of Nigeria. I engaged a senator some years ago between a professor and a senator who is contributing more to nation building. He was busy trying to defend, and I said, no, we have undervalued, underquantified, undermined the role of professors and academic in nation building. But we appreciate you. And that is the essence of this inaugural. And uh, let me now, on behalf of the um, management, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, the Senate, management, staff, and students of this university, present to you this talking gift as an appreciation of your scholarship and intellectual sagacity in this university. Um, university of Joss is very grateful for, to you, and that is the essence of this very important plaque. We want you to cherish it. This is the evidence that you have paid your debt. Keep it very well. And it is what we have as a token to present to you. We also want to present this gift to you as also a sign, animation of what you have done today and the delivery, very powerful and highly intellectual. <laughs> Finally, I said this last week, I'm going to give you now the, the blessing of the Vice Chancellor. The Lord will bless you and he will keep you. And his uh, countenance will shine upon you and your family. And this is just your the beginning. You will continue to move from strength to strength Amen. and from grace to grace, Amen. from power to power, Amen. from opportunity to opportunity. Amen. But we also continue to tap your brain for the benefit of our students and the University of Joss. We have noted your recommendations to us 
and uh, thankfully it's in the lecture. The Vice Chancellor is going to be fully briefed when he comes back. And I also want to appreciate your interdisciplinary approach, having to go to the Center for Conflict Management and Peace Studies to practically demonstrate the essence of poetry and your ability to strike the connection between poetry and global peace. Um, I was particularly thrilled when you said sex strike cause nakedness, isn't it? And uh, we're beginning to think of sending our women to Meduguri, to Mangu, <laughs> to go and use that weapon to bring peace to this nation. What you have done today is not just a contribution to our discussions on global peace, but also to please on the plateau Peace on the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Congratulations. God bless you. Congratulations, madam. Congratulations to every one of you. Congratulations. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you very much, the Vice Chancellor, for your kind presentation. Uh, the students of the Department of English, are you, clo are you close by? Please come forward immediately. The students of the Department of English, Faculty of Arts, presenting gifts to their head of department. Standing on all existing protocols, great NASA sites, great NASA sites. All right, um, we are standing here on behalf of the National Association of Students of English and Literary Studies. We are here in solidarity with our uh, teacher, our tutor, and a mentor. We are here in solidarity with him on the occasion of the presentation of his. Uh, inaugural lecture and uh, we are standing here as representatives of the student body to congratulate him specially and uh, to appreciate his contributions in our lives in our academic journey we wish we had money to present him a private jet at this point but the little we have for now is an award of excellence of which we are presenting to him at this point The PhD students from the same department are also presenting their gift. Please make it snappy. The PhD students also presenting their gift to their head of department. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. The, yeah, you can now take your seat, Prof. At this moment, we are down to the next item on the program here. Vote of thanks to be performed by the Dean, Faculty of Arts of the University of Joss, Professor Isaac Barcolar, Prof. Sir. Uh, good evening, everybody. Please, standing on the existing protocol, I want us to observe just four points. The first point I want to note is that Jeff Doki, what's he, he's gone ago. Aha. Yes, Jeff Doki 
He is a very articulate, extempor uh, extemporaneous lecturer. He talks, you know, without reference to notes. Not that he hasn't got notes, but because of a good mastery of curriculum content, he stands and gives very brilliant lectures. I've listened to him, I've co-taught with him, and I've worked with him. So this is a, cel a celebrated gentleman in his own right. We thank God for him. Secondly, I want to talk about the power of creative literature, which he has amply demonstrated as a powerful weapon in fostering peace and bringing about good interaction in human com community across the social divide. That's what we need in our time. Peace, not war. Thirdly, we talk about town and gown. Intellectuals churn out very brilliant ideas. But most of these ideas are just stuck in libraries, in bookshelves, and different places, departmental libraries and all. A time has come for the Nigerian society, the larger community, to begin to interface between university and the larger community so that curriculum content can be applied to the needs of society. And that's why I'm calling, finally, I'm calling finally on the political class who now dominate the, the, the scene in Nigeria that unless they begin to go back to academics where new and fresh ideas, global ideas, very fresh ideas indeed are being generated, they need to go and learn from those sources and then digest and assimilate those ideas for the common good of humanity so that society can be the better for it and we can solve a number of these religious crises and so on, communal clashes and all of that. So with these few points, I want to appreciate once more Professor Jeff Doki for a very brilliant work that he has done and is now bringing a fresh contribution for humanity. Even only these inaugural lectures have a way of being summarized by television houses, media houses and all, so that these ideas are shared rather than being kept in bookshelves. I think it will make a whole difference. Thank you for coming and God bless everybody. Thank you very much, the Dean Faculty of Arts, Professor Barkolar, for your vote of thanks. Uh, we have come to almost the conclusion of this gathering here. The closing prayer is the next item on the program. But before then, may I quickly announce that the faculty, the, the dean, staff, and students of the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine is inviting all of us to a public awareness lecture on an outbreak of a disease called anthrax. The lecture will take place in this same venue tomorrow, Wednesday, 26th July. May I invite Dr. Yusuf Abdullahi, who is the chief imam of the University of Jos, to close this gathering with a word of prayer. Dr. Yusuf. Salu ala Nabi al-Kareem. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ala Muhammadin wa rahim Muhammadin wa ala Muhammadin wa barik ala Muhammadin wa ala ala Muhammadin. Kama salli wa rahim wa barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim fil alamina inna ka hamidun majid. Ya Allah, we thank you for this hour. Ya Allah, we thank you for the life of Professor Jeff Godwin Doki, who has just presented this inaugural lecture. Ya Allah, our Vice Chancellor who traveled abroad for a function, Ya Allah, we pray that we bring him back safely. Our principal officers that are here, other members of governing council, our deans and directors, others, you know, professors that are here, Ya Allah, continue to bless their lives and guide them aright. To our students, Ya Allah, continue to guide us. Our state, Ya Allah, continue to bring lasting peace. Our country, Allah, continue to bless Nigeria so that we live in peace and enjoy the, the, your bounties on Afia. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa gina adhaba nar. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yisifun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Amin.
Thank you so very much, Doctor, for your prayers. Uh, this time around, we will take the University of Jos Anthem, the National Anthem, and the procession will follow suit in reverse order, beginning with the Vice-Chancellor. The University of Jos Anthem, please.